Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet, the Rundtree people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past and present and to elders from other communities who may be here today. It's my absolute pleasure to um, introduce today's speaker, Dr. Nicholas Kirk. Nick joined my lab way back in 2015, just after he'd finished a PhD in chemistry at uh, the University of Wollongong, uh, where he was developing new angiogenesis inhibitors. When he joined my lab, um, it was to take part in a, um, a screening project that we'd been running for, for quite a while. Um, and Nick came in and um, worked through everything that we were doing, and in the end concluded that we were chasing artifacts. So um, I, I'm very grateful to, to Nick for putting a dead end to that work. Um, otherwise, we would have continued for quite a while longer chasing artifacts. But it was about that time that um, the Cryo-EM revolution um, took place, and it became clear to my lab that we would have to move very quickly from the, um, our traditional strength in X-ray crystallography into um, cryem. And um, Nick saw the gap there to, um, to move away from chemistry, um, which I'm sure he still loves, and to join in with the cryem resolution, revolution. And, and Nick has done an outstanding job in that regard in my lab. Um, He's buried himself in it. He's contributed to every structure that we have been working on and together with Yibin Zhu in my lab has um, now published a number of papers in that regard. So I, I am very grateful to Nick to um, just spearheading that whole initiative in my lab. About that time also, um, we managed to obtain some funding from a, a big pharma company in the US and um, I diverted Nick onto that project, um, quite a lot of it of which involves CryEM itself. Um, and Nick has single-handedly been um, pursuing that project now for four years. The, the, um, the research collaboration has been renewed twice, um, so it's gone through review back in, in the company, and in each of those cases, obviously, it's been renewed, and, and that's um, totally new Nick's credit, all the work that he has done um, within that project. Unfortunately, being commercial in confidence, uh, Nick originally hoped he'd be able to talk to you about it today, um, but it's sort of not quite over the um, free-to-release um, point yet. Instead, um, Nick is going to tell you a different story today, um, which is something we picked up a collaboration with the um, Johnson Diabetes in uh, Centre um, a few years back, and um, it's now just come to fruition, and um, a paper has been submitted for publication. Nick is also an avid contributor to the whole CRAEM endeavor at WEHI um, in terms of the Tempo project, which I would refer you to go and have a look at, which is a whole training resource that, um, headed by uh, Andrew Lees and Josh Hardy, and Nick is an avid contributor to that. So, you know, um, so many projects now in WEHI have benefited from CRAEM, and um, it's really great to see all the effort and expertise that Nick has brought to that. So um, without further ado, um, Nick, let me hand it over to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, Mike's done a lot of the hard work. I was gonna uh, talk a bit about CryoEM and um, how useful it's become. Uh, recently, but I think Mike's talked a bit about that. Um, everyone here would have seen how quickly everything moved with uh, the developments uh, for treating COVID. And one of the first things that uh, came out were the structures of spike proteins. Um, we've sold a few of those structures here. And they were basically solved as soon as the protein was available. So everyone's pretty aware of uh, the advantages of the developments of cryo-EM, even if you don't do it directly. Um, we've seen uh, we've seen the outcomes of this with insulin receptor and the IGF receptor especially. Um, Mike and others worked uh, for decades to try and get the first structures and now they basically come out every month a new structure. We're also capturing the receptor in different states because cryo-EM captures things in motion rather than being stuffed into crystals. Uh, and beyond that, we're actually starting to find insulins 
uh, not just as endogenous hormones, but uh, in some strange ways, which I'll talk about today. So uh, today I'm going to talk about two stories about fishes. Uh, the first, I'll be hoping to answer uh, the question of why this fish has lost the will to live and why the cone snail there uh, is a bit involved. And the other story I'm going to tell is about why this fish has warts and whether we should eat it or not. So just as a, a brief outline, the first thing I'm going to do is talk a little bit about insulin, uh, a brief history of that. I'll then uh, ask you, ask the non-structural biologist to bear with me for a little while uh, while I talk about the insulin and IGF receptors, and then I'll be talking about cone snails, viruses, and fishes. So type 1 diabetes has been known uh, potentially for millennia uh, before this, but in the early 1920s, uh, the role of insulin and uh, the role of insulin itself in type 1 diabetes and the use of insulin as a therapeutic uh, occurred. Uh, Banting and Best, along with McLeod and Collett, finally worked out a way to purify insulin. Um, their first purifications were from dogs, uh, and they successfully showed in dogs in 1921 that they could uh, treat diabetic dogs with insulin that was purified from uh, dog pancreatic islets. Uh, the first human was actually treated uh, a couple months ago, a hundred years ago. So in early 1922 at the University of Toronto, uh, and obviously from there it's exploded into one of the, um, the, the most important drugs in the world. In the early 1950s, the peptide sequence was determined by Sanger uh, during the development of his peptide sequencing uh, method. And what he found was that it had two chains as a mature uh, peptide. And, this will be uh, important, well, this is important for the way that insulin works. Here's Fred Sanger. Um, in 1969, um, the seventh crystal structure of a, a peptide or protein ever solved was insulin, uh, and it shows this uh, unique uh, two-chain uh, appearance where there is the A chain at the top in a, a C or U shape, and then the B chain at the bottom in this S shape, and it's linked with uh, disulfides. Uh, one important part of this is actually this, uh, the end of the B chain here, which is able to hinge around and it's key to uh, how the binding works. Throughout the 70s, uh, the insulin receptor was purified and broadly characterized, first from crude membranes and then closer and closer to the protein itself, and eventually the DNA and peptide sequences were solved. Um, this, this here is uh, one of the first gels showing that uh, the receptor is actually cleaved when it's mature and it's made of disulfide linked um, uh, uh, monomers. And also uh, of note <clears throat> is that uh, both of these got Nobel Prizes. So this is the general broad structure of insulin. As I said, there is the A chain at the top in this U shape, the B chain at the bottom in this S shape, uh, the, C, the C terminus has the ability to fold out, which is obviously important. Uh, but there are also related insulin-like growth factors, which are, as you'll see, are very structurally related, um, A, B domain. Uh, and this is sort of the general structure of what insulin-like growth factors look like. They have the same A and B domains, but they also have this C peptide, which I've shown in cyan. Um, in immature insulin during processing, this C peptide is actually present. Uh, but it's cleaved off, and you'll see some um, interesting effects of this later in the talk. The insulin receptor is a receptor tyrosine kinase. Uh, broadly speaking, the receptor tyrosine kinases have three parts. Uh, they have the ligand binding domain, which is uh, an ectodomain. They have a transmembrane uh, helix, which is uh, key to how the information of receiving the ligand is transmitted inside. And then they also have this tyrosine kinase domain, which is the functional uh, cytosolic part of the receptor. So the job of a receptor tyrosine kinase is to receive an extracellular signal in the form of a ligand. That ligand binding transmits a signal through a conformational change in the transmembrane region, which is transmitted to the cytosolic portion, which is the tyrosine kinase. There's then a series of phosphorylation events, obviously using ATP, and this uh, gives us our active kinases, and then a series of adapter proteins will bind to these phosphorylated uh, tyrosines 
and they'll either be phosphorylated themselves or otherwise activated to go on to do uh, all of their functions. One of the interesting parts is that the stereotypical receptor tyrosine kinases are monomers in their mature form. So things like VEGF, uh, the vascular endothelial growth factor, and uh, EGF are monomers in their inactive form as mature receptors. And dimerization of the whole receptor is kind of the, the key uh, structural change that leads to activation. But in the case of insulin receptor, it's actually a dimer as a, a mature receptor. So instead of just having dimerization, there has to be a big conformational change to signal activation. So what is their signaling pathways? Uh, it's important to note that the insulin receptor and the IGF-1 uh, receptor are very similar. They're uh, about 50% homologous and over 80% uh, in the kinase domain. Um, there are insulin homologues in all vertebrates and uh, some invertebrates, and most of them are quite similar. So uh, what's been uh, discovered is that they're actually similar enough that uh, different species insulin can affect other species. Uh, hence why uh, the dog insulin was originally used to treat a human patient, uh, and also the uh, original structure that I showed was a pig insulin, not a human insulin. Uh, everyone knows insulin's a vital hormone for development and glucose homeostasis. Um, the canonical pathway is essentially that insulin binds to its receptor. It causes a phosphorylation. Uh, the first uh, adapter protein is one of the insulin receptor substrates. And then it goes through a series of steps that I've, I've uh, grossly simplified through PI3 kinase, AKT, uh, as well as mTOR. And this leads to a series of metabolic outcomes that are primary, primarily anabolic. Um, the the GLUT4 insertion into the membrane um, happens at the level of AKT. Um, so when it comes to diabetes, type 1 diabetes is obviously deletion of the beta cells so that you don't get insulin production. But type 2 diabetes uh, is a breakdown in uh, all of these intracellular components signaling. When we think about IGF, uh, we typically think about uh, IGF-1 binding to the IGF-1 receptor, you get a phosphorylation. The adapter protein is Schick, although it can bind insulin receptor substrates as well. And you get signaling through RAS, <coughs> MEC, ERX. And the, the typical outcome you expect is a mitogenic effect. So uh, IGF-1 is one of the key mediators of the effects of growth hormone. Um, so it has growth promoting effects on almost every cell in the body. Uh, breakdowns in IGF signaling are implicated uh, obviously, in cancer, uh, if you get a huge overexpression uh, of this pathway, you're going to get a lot of growth, and that is going to um, obviously promote uh, uh, cancer cell growth uh, and uh, metastases. Uh, but the story isn't quite as simple as this. One example of this is that there's a second IGF ligand, IGF-2, and this can bind to both receptors. Uh, some of the most interesting effects are actually binding to the insulin receptor uh, rather than the IGF receptor. And also that signaling through the insulin receptor can cross pathways one way and signaling through the IGF receptor can cross pathways the other way. Um, sort of the key, uh, the key point of this is that we need to really carefully understand how the ligands affect the receptors in order to know which uh, which events lead to uh, which signaling outcomes. So we're trying to get that all the way to the atomic level. Uh, and that's what we're doing with cryoEM. So this is the structure of the mature insulin receptor. I just note that this is, this is built up of multiple structures. So we weren't lucky enough to get one giant full length structure in the, in the APO form. Um, you can see the overall shape is a symmetric dimer. It's uh, this bent over V shape. I've drawn one monomer uh, as white, which hopefully you can see, and the other monomer is, is gray. Um, just to orient you, we have the membrane here, so the extracellular portion uh, is at the top of the slide and the cytosolic at the bottom. The kinases uh, in the APO conformation are held apart, so the receptor's job is essentially, or the, the ectodomain of the receptor's job, is to hold these kinases apart as if the receptor uh, is two monomers rather than one. So we have the kinase domains here, uh, the transmembrane helices. The key binding site uh, is found up here, uh, and it's made up of a few portions. There's the uh, leucine-rich L1 and CR, and these sort of form a hand. And then the alpha-CT peptide uh, 
uh, which is kind of like a thumb that uh, the ligand can grab onto. We have the L2, which acts as a hinge to allow big motions of the receptor. We have fibronectin 1, which is also key to the conformation of the active receptor. And then fibronectin 2 and 3 that sort of provide structural support. So I'll just give this a quick spin just so that you can see um, the binding sites sort of fall into this zone up the top. Uh, and it's symmetrical, but uh, it isn't when it's um, activated. So this is the uh, active signaling form of insulin, again, uh, insulin receptor, again, built up from multiple structures. Um, what did I want to say here? It's overall a, a J-shaped conformation, and insulin is up here, although I'll show another view where that's more clear in a moment. What it does is it clips onto that alpha CT helix, and leads the helix to extend, and then uh, this has a lot of uh, intra-receptor interactions that stabilize uh, the overall structure of the ectodomain. What this does is it brings the transmembrane helices together and then allows the kinase domains uh, to dimerize. So uh, I'll just get through that, that's not really important. Um, so overall, the gray monomer is essentially in the same conformation uh, as uh, the APO, but the uh, white monomer here, the, the L1CR has reached all the way to the top and you get this extended helix all the way through that's transmitted into this dimerization. So I'll just zoom in at the top, looking from uh, out of the screen. This is the uh, binding site. We have the A domain, again, the C shape in salmon color. The B domain is this S shape uh, in uh, magenta and cyan, the alpha CT helix in yellow. Uh, this is the fibronectin prime. So this is the fibronectin one domain from the opposite monomer. And you can see that it's, it's clipped around the alpha CT. And the key part is this uh, B chain extension, which I've colored in cyan. And this really uh, tucks in under the alpha CT and has a few uh, really high affinity interactions um, that sort of hold everything in place. Um, other groups have tried to get the full length receptor. Uh, and the way that they did that, they obviously expressed the full length receptor and, uh, with um, inner micelle and then they racked up as much insulin as they could get into the solution, which they found stabilized it. But they still failed to resolve the transmembrane and, and kinases. What they did see, though, was this uh, symmetric T-shaped uh, uh, conformation, and there are four insulins. The two in magenta are the same and symmetrical, and the two in cyan are binding to a completely different site, which uh, we hadn't seen before, um, and they're also symmetrical. Um, we don't think that this is the state you'll see in vivo because there's something like 10,000 fold more insulin than you'd ever get in plasma. Um, but what it does tell us about is the conformational landscape of the receptor. So uh, perhaps only one of these insulins would ever bind at once, but all of these conformations are within reach of the energetics of the receptor. What we think this cyan site represents is actually the initial site of contact. Um, and the cool thing about this is that uh, multiple groups have, have worked on um, similar uh, uh, complexes, and by using cryo-EM, you can actually capture multiple different complexes, different states uh, in the same data set and process them in a way which you can be confident uh, is uh, the actual dynamics of your receptor uh, and not an artifact. So here you can just see that this is a, a symmetric T-shape and that the legs are also together in this case. So this leads to uh, an activation mechanism. First, we have monomeric insulin in solution. This binds to the site that I showed in cyan. It, we call this site too for reasons that aren't important. Uh, the alpha CT then uh, uh, threads through the insulin, detaches from that site too, and then is arranged to the top of the receptor. So these are going from the, the V shape into the J shape. I said that the IGF receptor is very similar and that's uh, been borne out in the structural biology. On the left is the APO. This is from a crystal structure that Yibin did uh, a few years ago, and this would have the same auto-inhibited uh, monomeric kinases. And then on the right, you again see pretty much the same J-shaped uh, active conformation. Um, we haven't seen the T-shaped conformation, even putting as much IGF uh, as we can into the solution. Um, and so it was a bit uh, less clear about uh, what the um, the intermediates were. Uh, 
uh, one hint of a possibility was something crazy that Yuvin did, which was to take the already formed crystals of, um, of the APO IGF receptor and pretend that IGF was a drug compound and uh, soaked it into the crystals. And even though they cracked and changed shape, he managed to resolve this structure in the middle. So this isn't really definitive proof because it's a fairly artificial scenario, but it does suggest that it may be possible for IGF to bind directly to the binding site rather than first having this uh, initial contact. Uh, so this is uh, a proposed activation mechanism. Again, we have this direct contact uh, with the APO receptor, some hinging motions, and then the activation is when the legs come together and you get phosphorylation. So just as a, a quick summary of the important points there, APO receptors are V or U shaped. The kinase domains are held apart. The active conformation has one ligand bound and forms these J shapes, allowing kinase dimerization and signaling. We can see multiple ligands bound to one receptor, inducing uh, strange conformations. And the activation mechanisms are multiple steps. So um, I just want to show you this movie about answering the first question. So on the right, uh, you'll see a cone snail, conus geographus. Uh, and it's actually previously harpooned uh, and envenomated this fish. Um, a lot of the components of the venom are uh, uh, ion channel blockers, but one of the interesting components is actually an insulin. And it's not an insulin that activates its own receptors, but it's one that's evolved to act on the fish's receptors. Uh, it's turned out after the discovery of this that many cone snails have venom insulins. And one thing that's known about venomous creatures, uh, marine venomous creatures, is that their toxins have to be very potent because uh, their victims can literally swim anywhere. Um, this work is primarily done uh, with Danny Cho at Stanford uh, and collaborators, collaborators at the University of Utah and, and in um, Mike's lab. So I, I wasn't uh, directly involved in this, but I think that this story is uh, too interesting not to tell again. So what's interesting about these cone snail uh, venom insulins? I mentioned before how similar vertebrate uh, insulins can be. And so the original thought of this was maybe these fast acting uh, insulins might be able to uh, activate human receptors and then therefore give us a hyper fast acting insulin therapeutic. Um, the idea of this study in general was that we have a bunch of uh, different cone snail venoms, and if we take the best features of each, we might be able to optimize a better therapeutic insulin. So what are those features? Um, again, we see the, the A domain and the B domain. This is just an alignment of the uh, human insulin at the top and then all of the cone snail insulins in the second and third groups. Um, one of the, the key features, this is this uh, B domain uh, terminus that I mentioned that tucks under the alpha CT. And the reason why these are highlighted in red is because with human insulin, if you delete these, it doesn't work anymore. And yet, none of uh, these aren't found in any of the cone snail insulins, and yet they still do work. So the, the uh, hypothesis as to how they overcome this uh, complete loss of affinity is that they instead have an extension of the A domain. Uh, and that is seen in some groups of the cone snail insulins. And the other thing is that they have these additional, hopefully you can see that, uh, aromatic residues at the end of the B domain that may form uh, similar interactions. Just to prove that uh, the insulin is actually active in this venom in spite of all of the, the other um, components, um, this is just a simple experiment, adding one of these cone snail insulins uh, to treat zebrafish. You can see on the left that uh, with no, with just a vehicle, that uh, the fish is moving around freely, zipping about. And on the right, uh, this zebra fish has completely lost the will to live. Uh, so the group at Utah got a cryo-EM structure of this. Actually, they got two cryo-EM structures. Um, both of these are from the same data set. So it was the same preparation of the insulin receptor with one of these uh, cone snail optimized uh, sorry, there's uh, an optimized hybrid insulin that includes these features from cone snails. Um, and this is one of the cool things that we see with cryo-EM is that we're capturing the receptor in motion. Um, you can see that uh, the conformation on the right looks very similar to the previous with the four insulins bound, and it essentially is identical in terms of the broad structure. But on the left, uh, 
uh, you can see the insulin here that I've colored in black, which is in an intermediate state. Um, even though this wasn't a primary outcome uh, of this study, this actually has captured the insulin receptor in the act of activating, which had never been seen before. Um, so just so that that's apparent, uh, in the, the magenta circle is where the insulin would be if it was in its active state. And I've just drawn an arrow to show uh, the gross motion that has to occur um, in order to accommodate that, which obviously you can't see. So what about the binding site itself? Um, again, I have the A domains colored in the same colors, magenta, uh, uh, salmon and magenta. This is insulin on the left, complex to insulin receptor. Uh, you can see that this cyan B chain extension is pressing under the alpha CT, whereas in this cone snail optimized hybrid uh, insulin, also bound to uh, the insulin receptor, the A chain here is the part that's extended. So there's an extra turn in that helix uh, on the A domain rather than an extension of the B domain. Um, I've just highlighted where that is uh, in cyan. So this is the insulin at the top, this is this extension, and there are four residues that come off here uh, in the optimized uh, hybrid. One of the other key features is the swap of a histidine for uh, a glutamate here, which I've circled uh, in the black circle, and this forms a key salt bridge that isn't seen uh, in uh, the insulin to insulin receptor uh, uh, structure. So not only does this show how cryo-EM can actually be used as part of a, a therapeutic development pipeline, um, it's also shown us how useful it can be for picking apart the structural biology of the receptor itself. So on to the warty fish. Um, on the left, uh, you see Nemo, and you might be able to just see uh, near his tail, he's got some little warty uh, growths here. On the right, this is a cichlid. I think it's a, a convict fish. This also has this, uh, this same warts. And this is caused by something that's called lymphocystis disease or cauliflower disease. Um, these cichlids themselves, uh, just as an aside, are, are pretty crazy. There's more, there are more species of, of these fish in a single lake in Africa than there are uh, freshwater fish species in all of Europe. So they're under this crazy evolutionary pressure uh, in Lake Malawi. And they're also strangely aggressive for such little fish. Um, my, brother, my brother, Josh, bred these for a while because he thought he'd uh, make some money out of them. And he always had an uh, extra quarantine tank when he got new fish, and I had no idea what it was for. And it actually turns out that it's exactly for these sort of diseases, like lymphocystis, because in warm water, they run their course in about a week. So if you get a new fish, you don't really have to worry about it having this disease as long as you can keep it um, separated. Um, lymphocystis disease affects over 100 fish species in cold and warm water, in marine environments and in fresh water. Uh, it's been known since the late 1800s as a disease. Uh, and it's uh, identified by these wart-like lesions, as I said. Uh, it spreads by fish-to-fish -fish contact, and there's also some evidence that the virus uh, is viable in water. Um, okay. So the virus, uh, the first virus uh, that causes lymphocystis disease was this uh, LCDV1, lymph lymphocystis disease virus 1. Uh, it's in the urudovirus family, uh, in its own genus, lymphocystivirus genus. Uh, on the left, we just have a schematic diagram uh, of the uh, general uh, family. Uh, it's uh, an enveloped virion, so it has its uh, capsid coat and it also has an outer membrane with surface proteins in it. Uh, they're typically, they're polyhedral or 20-sided. And one of the crazy features about this, um, this, this virus and the disease that it causes is uh, the gross hypertrophy uh, of cells. Uh, that are caused by the virus, and particularly by uh, uh, an interesting molecule that's involved. So it's hard to see here, but uh, F, F is pointing to a normal cell, which is basically the size of the pointer, and uh, L is labeling one of these hypertrophied cells that uh, has the virus in it. Um, there were some examples of these where single cells were seen up to two millimeters. So they're ridiculous uh, hypertrophy. Also, some of these uh, dark features up here are actually um, 2D crystals of the virus that forms. There's the, the lesions themselves are absolutely packed full of this virus. Um, so in terms of the overall, the overall gene, uh, the genome of the virus, 
Uh, LCDV1 is a double-stranded DNA virus, about 100 kilobase pairs. Uh, there are several homologues of uh, various um, mammalian hormones, so it's really interesting and there's a lot, a lot to be taken from it, but I've just uh, circled here in Magenta the reason why we're interested in it, and it's because it has an IGF uh, homology. Uh, these are, uh, they've come up with a name for these, these viral insulin or IGF-like peptides, or VILPs. So this is uh, working in collaboration with uh, Emeril Tindis at Boston College. He's leading the project. Uh, he does a lot of uh, research in this area uh, based around microbial mimicry of hormones uh, and autoimmunity and the origins of type 1 diabetes. Uh, and he's a former postdoc of a real big shot, uh, C. Ronald Kahn, who's uh, the other collaborator. He's had various uh, leadership positions at the Joslin Diabetes Center at Harvard Medical Center. And his biggest achievement uh, was a Wolf Prize uh, in 2016. And he got that for his work with the insulin receptor signaling pathways. Uh, notably, he discovered, or his team discovered the insulin receptor kinase. They elucidated a lot of the intracellular signaling work. Uh, and they come up with a molecular mechanism of insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes and obesity. Um, this collaboration actually came about from a pretty uh, bougie event that we got to go to uh, in Ventura, an IGF and insulin uh, uh, conference. And uh, Ron was the uh, keynote speaker, and he actually came directly to Mike to uh, ask if we could help him solve structures of these peptides uh, with the uh, insulin and IGF receptors. So why do we care about these? Uh, as I've said, these, these VILPs are found in several aridoviruses that can affect uh, fish species all over the world in different environments. Uh, what's been discovered from some of these references I have at the, the bottom left is that these VILPs can potently affect normal human IGF receptor and insulin receptor signaling. Um, people are exposed to infected fish uh, the VILP DNA has been identified in human gut and plasma samples, so uh, we probably are getting a bit of interaction with these. And the concerns in this, obviously this is speculative at this point, but people are being exposed to uh, potential mammalian toxins. Uh, it could be a source of autoimmunity by molecular mimicry, although uh, previous scans uh, haven't brought these up as um, the most uh, likely candidates. And also, they can just directly uh, affect IGF receptor signaling, particularly in the digestive tract. Um, and this may have implications in uh, colorectal cancer, uh, cancer. Okay. So what is the actual structure of these? Uh, this is just an alignment of insulin and IGF from human uh, and the LCDV1 VILP. Uh, you can see they have the same overall uh, BCA structure. Um, they, they share the same uh, overall architecture of disulfide bonds that are highlighted in red here. They also share uh, a bunch of the key binding residues that are highlighted with uh, the stars. Uh, and the other interesting part is that uh, what's shown up here is, is insulin C peptide, and it has this sequence, uh, two R's, the N terminus, and KR, the C terminus. And this is the uh, cleavage recognition sequence. So IGF doesn't have this sequence, um, and that's why the C-peptide remains. But interestingly, the LCDV1 VILP has the first sequence, but it doesn't have the second. So it's not clear uh, whether it will be cleaved or not. Um, the structure of these uh, was predicted before AlphaFold, but I've just got some AlphaFold predictions just to show you. This is the SC, or the, the single chain one piece LCDV1 VILP. You can see it has the same A, A B domain plus C-peptide structure. Comparing it to human IGF-1, you can see the obvious uh, similarities there. And this is uh, the double chain, uh, potentially. So if there is a cleavage event, uh, we would expect to see this DC LCDV1, which looks a lot like insulin. Uh, so some of the, the work on this project that's uh, gone into this paper is uh, working out uh, what type of agonists, uh, what type of uh, ligands these VILPs are for IGF-1 receptor. So in this gel, uh, you'll see that uh, we're separating the uh, phosphorylated and unphosphorylated uh, members of the IGF-1 receptor signaling pathway. Uh, in this column here, we have the results for IGF-1. So we see strong bands for phosphorylated IGF-1 receptor. 
Downstream of this, we see strong signal for phosphorylated AK AKT, and we also see a strong signal for phosphorylated ERK1 and 2. Uh, if we take this same concentration of IGF-1 and add on top of that uh, the single chain uh, VILP, we can see that uh, as you titrate in more and more of the VILP, you lose the phosphorylation of the receptor. And this is also seen uh, intracellularly with loss of phosphorylation of AKT and loss of ERK. If you take uh, the C-peptide cleaved version, this DC uh, LCDV1 VILP, we see only very mild effects possibly at very high concentration. So at this point, we started focusing uh, efforts on the single chain. Um, this is essentially just another way of representing the same thing, but on the left is the overall phosphorylation of the receptor and the concentration is increasing from left to right. Uh, in black, you can see that if we add in IGF-1, there is some basal signaling, about 20% of the receptors phosphorylated even in the APO state, and that as you titrate in IGF-1, we see a very high signal all the way up to 80%. The LCDV1 is in green. This start, if you titrate this in, you start with basal signaling, and then this actually drops beyond that. So this suggests that not only is it uh, just getting in the way of IGF binding, but that it's actually locking the receptor in a state that even blocks basal signaling. And again, if you have a constant concentration of IGF and you titrate in LCDV1, you go all the way from uh, complete phosphorylation all the way down to baseline. So from this, we knew it was a competitive antagonist, but uh, my job in this project was to get a structure of this and um, determine what the molecular mechanism of this was. So I've just got uh, a processing pipeline here. Uh, the micrograph looks far worse on the screen here than it does when you see the actual micrograph, but uh, this is just the motion corrected micrograph. That's always the first step in cryo EM. Everything's captured as movies, and you have to cancel out all of the, the movement that occurs during the collection. You then use, in our case, we used a neural network to find all of the particles, and then we extracted the images of the particles. We then classify these uh, into all of the different confirmations, which is what you see at the bottom left here. Um, this obviously isn't perfect. And so you pick up a bunch of crap along with your good particles. So what you do is you do 3D classifications. This first round of classification at the top is just to remove junk. Uh, we then re-extract the good particles at full resolution, and then we do another 3D classification. Uh, in this case, I saw three uh, fairly different uh, confirmations, uh, but the one on the left here in, in blue um, was the most complete in terms of the, the whole receptor. We then refine this structure to get the maximum resolution, and uh, it resolved to about uh, just under five angstroms, which tells us that we can get the, the gross features and we can probably find the helices. Um, but in our case, we know so much about these receptors that it was really easy to place um, all of the uh, chains. So this is the structure that results. Um, what you'll see is that it looks a bit squatter than a normal receptor, and that's because uh, there are two domains, the fibronectin threes, that haven't resolved. And the reason why is because they're so flexible that um, they just uh, disappear when you average all the particles together. Uh, this makes sense for, for what we're expecting to see because, as you can see, that the legs are apart like they are in the APO conformation. So what we think we've captured here is basically a version of a stabilized APO receptor. Um, you can see the alpha CT helices are extended all the way to the center. Um, one possible explanation for this stability is actually just that uh, they've, they've formed rigid helices that are now happy where they are and they don't want to move about anymore. Um, you can see that, uh, and just, just as a side note, you can see that the, uh, the density uh, in this case isn't extended to the middle, but that's just because I've raised the threshold of the map um, so that you can see some more features. Um, it's pseudosymmetric. One of the VILPs uh, is actually making contact with the fibronectin one, which you'll see uh, coming around now. And this was the, the higher resolution resolved one. And on the opposite side, it was sort of floating free. So this made us think that uh, a, bit, a key part of the story as to why this is an antagonist isn't that uh, the VILP itself is stabilizing this APO conformation, but also that it has some unfavorable interactions where IGF-1 normally binds. Um, 
Apart from Yibin's forcing IGF into to crystals uh, structure, this is the first IGF receptor structure that has more than one ligand. Um, previous efforts to try and do this have always resulted in a single ligand bound structure. So this is a completely different uh, confirmation in terms of liganded uh, IGF receptor compared to everything else. So just to, to make this um, completely crystal clear, um, on the left, we have this uh, vilt bound IGF receptor structure. On the right, this is uh, one of uh, Yibin and Meyer's structures, the IGF2 bound to the uh, IGF receptor. I've just uh, added in where the, the third fibronectin would be uh, in gray. You can see that uh, the IGF molecule itself is all the way at the top of the receptor, which uh, if it was to be on the vilt structure would be all the way up here. Um, and in order to get there, you'd have to have a huge conformational change. So what we have caught really is uh, an intermediate uh, or an APO state, and it, it's nothing at all like the um, signaling conformation. Um, just so you can directly see what's happening to each monomer, um, we have the APO receptor overlaid with a monomer from the vilt bound receptor. The APO receptor is in gray and the vilt bound is in green. The vilt molecule itself is in this dark green here. There's a tiny little change from this angle compared to IGF-1 binding, which is a complete flip out of that domain. Um, the multiple domain um, movement. And if we move it 90 degrees uh, towards you, um, you can see that the IGF-1 receptor in the VILP case has essentially just made room for um, the, the VILP. It hasn't made any um, major changes. And this is compared to IGF-1 where we get this gigantic um, upwards shift. So the question uh, I raised was about whether the antagonism is because it's stabilized in one conformation or destabilized in the other. Um, and there's some evidence of the destabilization. So this is just an overlay of the IGF-1 receptor bound to IGF-1. Uh, the IGF-1 ligand is in uh, magenta. And I've just taken just the VILT molecule and overlaid it uh, in cyan over the top. So in terms of the, the gross uh, conformation, it's essentially identical to the IGF-1 receptor. There are some small variations seen uh, in this corner here. Um, but if I zoom in on that, we have some, uh, some interactions that we think might be key. Um, I haven't filled in, in the, uh, the space filling uh, around these atoms, but there's a key interaction in the IGF-1 receptor uh, bound to IGF. So in the case of IGF-1 in magenta here, it's a glycine. So this is a pretty flexible amino acid and it doesn't take up any space, so it doesn't have a side chain. So uh, in the IGF-1 uh, case, this arginine uh, actually pokes pretty deeply into the pocket, forms an interaction uh, with, among others, uh, GLU-693 uh, from the alpha-CT molecules. And this is a, a key interaction. Uh, and in the case of the VILP, there's a serine here. This doesn't have the same flexibility as glycine, and it's also literally just blocking the pocket by forming interactions. So, this would make this confirmation uh, unfavorable. Additionally, uh, if we look at the bottom, there's a key interaction from IGF-1 that's missing. Uh, again, in magenta, uh, GLU-9 from IGF forms this beautiful ideal salt bridge with arginine-484, and at the same time, pi stacks against uh, tyrosine-448. And in the case of the VILP, there's a histidine at this position, which would electro, uh, have electrostatic uh, repulsion from this position. So with these interactions unavailable, there's essentially nothing that's really keeping the VILP at the top of the receptor. So uh, considering the, the stability that we see in the APO conformation, it sort of makes sense why it acts as an antagonist. So if we compare this now to uh, the overall mechanism of activation, uh, with IGF-1, you start from this auto-inhibited uh, U-shape, you get binding of the IGF ligand, you get a series of hinging motions and you get your active state. And where the VILP comes in is essentially by gumming up the receptor here at this initial binding, and therefore you get no signaling beyond that. So just to summarize all of this, um, there's a lot more to insulin than just uh, glucose homeostasis. Nature's full of insulins. Um, and they're a source of therapeutics, not just for diabetes, but for all sorts of things, but also potentially pathogenic. Um, some species utilize insulin as a weapon. Uh, there's cone snail venoms and erudoviruses, and there are others out there. Humans are exposed to these weaponized insulins, so we should uh, research these to make sure we understand their implications. 
um, potentially an autoimmunity by mimicking insulin and causing um, insulin or IGF um, and leading to autoimmunity or even in cancer development. Um, and we also showed in this study that uh, this VILP is a potent competitive antagonist of IGF-1 receptor. Um, it induces a really interesting confirmation in the receptor overall. And I didn't really bring this up, but um, there have been a lot of unsuccessful inhibitors of the IGF-1 receptor that have never made it through the clinic. Uh, and if we use this as a drug, it would have a fairly different um, mode of action on the receptor. So there is some interest in developing this as uh, an anti-cancer agent. So that just leaves me uh, to acknowledgements and credits. Um, obviously, Mike, um, uh, our, uh, the Lawrence Lab has now ended and we've been enveloped by the uh, Glucova juggernaut. Um, and Mike, Mike retired at the end of last year and I can only just um, say thanks to Mike. He gave me multiple opportunities um, in terms of career development, even before it was mandatory. Um, he allowed me to go from chemistry to biochemistry all the way to cryo-EM. Um, and he's given me the time, even paying me as a postdoc, he's given me the time to um, take time out to learn these things properly um, rather than being concerned with um, the time I'm spending on it. Um, there are a few former Lawrence Lab members um, Yibin obviously is down here. He solved a lot of the IGF-1, the initial IGF-1 structures. Um, May is an amazing RA and also always gave us a beautiful protein. Um, John Menting used to be in the lab, did a lot of the work related to cone snails. I uh, also want to thank the collaborators, obviously, uh, Ron Kahn. Uh, Francois Moreau is uh, the postdoc in Ron Kahn's lab who's leading all the biological aspects of the VILT project. Uh, and Emra Altindus, who's the overall PI on this project, and all his lab members. Um, I want to thank Danny Cho at, at Stanford. He's uh, one of the other key members in the cone snail story. I uh, also want to thank uh, Alyssa for taking Mike and I on um, while we spend the rest of our grant money. Um, and also, uh, I want to thank uh, the Ramachati Centre, where we've done um, most of this um, cryo-EM work, and especially Harry and everyone that does um, cryo EM in Melbourne knows Harry and he's contributed, I don't know, to some ludicrous percentage of all of the cryo EM structures solved in Australia. And obviously just to thank uh, the NHMRC for funding and the Australian Synchrotron. And I'll take questions. Nick, th uh, thank you very much. Um, I assume you now all put off having sushi for lunch. Um, toss your sushi in the bin on the way out. Um, but more seriously, um, Nick, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we're now open to questions. I'll start with the floor. So watch out, they're, they're bitey. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was interested in the fact that this will uh, have been found in humans and because of that, the way that you have acted is so important for pregnancy and development of organs like the placenta. I was wondering if there's ever been any correlation between finding these and placenta development in humans. Right, yeah, really good question. Um, I think at this point, it's a bit preliminary. So uh, these have been found uh, the D as the DNA um, in these samples. Um, and I think they were only first discovered a few years ago. So uh, I'm not sure, I'm not aware of any direct correlations that have been made. I'm, I'm sure those studies are under, underway. And yeah, that's exactly the sort of thing that we'll be looking at. Yeah, okay, so, so the question was uh, regarding the um, 
sort of the, the proposed mechanism of action of insulin activating about the initial binding site um, and about the structural changes that happen after that. Um, so the, the binding site has an affinity sort of in the tens of micromolar. So we don't think it would be anything beyond transient. Um, as far as I know, the concentrations of insulin in plasma never get beyond like low nanomolar, very low nanomolar concentrations. Um, and we've seen that uh, in order to, to bind two insulins to the same uh, receptor requires way higher concentrations because it actually shows negative cooperativity. Um, it's possible that there's a, a, a second interaction, but one of, the, one of the key things that actually happens is that the alpha-CT peptide has a disordered end on it that sort of pokes out um, into the breeze a bit. Uh, and the way that the insulin binds lines up perfectly for that alpha-CT to sort of thread into it. And in all of the binding conformations that are seen, uh, it's more ordered. And it seems to form some uh, fairly um, uh, 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 high affinity sort of interactions, some very favorable interactions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That there's a there's a certain amount of there's a certain amount of conformational flexibility in the APO receptor, which is sort of reflected in the basal signaling. Um, and so, I guess a more a more precise way of saying it is that it help it it captures a particular conformation in that sort of landscape, which then uh, sort of sets a point at which it uh, has to go to act activation, if that makes sense. Thanks, Nick. Um, I think we've got a question in Slido here. Uh, let me hop over to that. Um, it says, hi, Nick. Uh, regarding competitive antagonism of VILP, given that it causes more cell growth in fish, are you surprised that it switches off human IGF-1R? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, and there were some, there's been some preliminary studies into this, um, and a lot of it seems to be that for some reason, that IGF-1 molecule um, is key to the growth of the virus itself, and that that's why the, the cells expand. Um, it has a bunch of other potential vertebrate hormones and proteins that likely have some other effects, but as far as I know, it's been shown that the IGF is important for the, the viral expansion, um, but I don't think all, it's not that every single interaction has been worked out, so the actual cell, um, the cell implications itself aren't um, completely known. And I'll just take uh, another question from Slido. Um, hi, Nick. Uh, is there any full-length insulin receptor structure solved yet? If not, what is the hardest part of getting the full-length structure? Yeah, this is... Uh, <laughs> yeah. If I could answer this question, I'd have as many nature papers as I wanted. Um, Full-length protein has been uh, has been prepared into cryo EM samples. Um, there were some of the the T-shaped ones that I showed earlier, uh, and what they typically see is that the resolution drops and drops and drops the closer you get to the membrane. So these were solved in um, my cells, I believe, and you can almost resolve the transmembrane if you kind of squint. But the key seems to be that there's about I believe about 15 residues between the bottom of the membrane and the top of the kinase domains. And it's likely that uh, the kinase domains actually are somewhat associated with the membrane itself. Um, and so it's possible that when you do something like using detergent micelles that you're sort of um, creating some really non-specific areas for these kinases uh, to be. And there's nothing stabilizing them in a particular position because there's no need for them to be that way in cells. Like evolutionarily wise. And so essentially the problem is that even if they're there, they're just moving around so much that you can't resolve them. Um, the solution to that would probably just be uh, doing what was done for telomerase and just collecting like 50,000 movies over a month and just having so many particles that you have 10,000 of every single possible degree of freedom. Uh, Matt, 
Is the same true of IGF receptors? And if so, what kind of mechanism is going on there because they're already built as that? Hmm. That are non-signaling neurons. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, there's a lot of a lot more complexity to the system than I, I brought up, obviously. That, um, the IGF-1s themselves have binding proteins that shield them from the receptor. And actually, the, the expression of the various IGFs um, is fairly different to what I propose in, in, in that IGF-2 is typically expressed more than IGF-1. Um, that's hard to speculate on. I'm not actually sure if it's the IGF ligand itself that is more often upregulated, or if it's the receptor itself. Um, I would imagine that the the receptor would could possibly just be limiting; that it may not be. I'm not. I'm not certain of how much it's expressed in the cells because it is tightly controlled, um, and it may just be that it's always uh, limiting, and that in the in the case of cancers, it's just taking advantage of the ligand that's present. But that's speculation on on my part. I guess the existence of basal level of signaling there suggests that there is some level of ligand free signaling. That, yeah, that's that's also a possibility. So it's it's something like twenty percent. Um, so you would have to be ex overexpressing by a lot the the receptor. But yeah, that's that's one possibility. Just that yeah, the basal signaling is enough if you've got enough protein. Interesting point. Yeah, if I can, if I can just butt in on that point. I mean, w what Nick shows for the APO structures, the, the interesting thing is that there has never been an APO structure determined by cry EM. So all the attempts at that have led to relatively low resolution structures indicating that the molecule is intrinsically flexible. So I think the model that we have in our head is that there's a certain percentage of time that the APO receptor is actually in a signaling active conformation. It would make sense, but then allied also to your question is whether you can get not only transactivation within the dimer, so to speak, but transactivation from dimer to dimer as the percentage goes up. Um, I don't think there's much evidence for that. Um, maybe it's just got to do with the orientation of molecules. Um, how are we doing on time? I'll take one last. I'll take one last question from Slido. Um, from Elisa, gorgeous structures, Nick. Do you think it is possible to have some local increase in insulin concentration? To just add it, and I'm, I'm thinking those structures with multiple insulins bound that were done far higher concentrations. Um, I suppose that would be that would be possible. They're they're expressed in the pancreas, and a, a lot of the insulin receptor is in the liver and the uh, the muscles. So possibly. Uh, Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting maybe that in during the first pass into the bloodstream that the liver might see a bit more, but uh, the, measurements are, the measurements were in plasma and they never get anywhere near that. So maybe there are certain cases of, of even the, the pancreas signaling to itself that if there are insulin receptors around there that um, they might experience this, but I wouldn't think so in general. All right, uh, we bang on two o'clock. Uh, thank you all for attending, and Nick, thank you for an excellent talk. Thank, thank you. you.